Thank you, everyone. We want to talk uh, a little bit about growth strategies for uh, for um, ventures in the climate tech um, um, ecosystem. And we have here um, Adi, Adi Horvitz Lavi, Dr. Adi Horvitz Lavi from uh, Bank Poalim. Hello, Adi. Hi, thank you for having me. Lee Rabinovitz Segal from uh, 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 Meitar Law. Hi, Lee. Hello, everyone. Matan Friedman, co founder at uh, Generate Capital. Hello. Good morning, everyone. And Roy Fuhrman. Hi, Roy, from uh, uh, Doral Energy Tech Ventures. Hey, good morning. So, thank you, guys. Um, we want to talk a little bit about growth strategy. I want to start with, uh, with you, Adi, um, and maybe ask you, as a, as a banker, as, a, as, as someone has, that sees a huge amount of uh, tech startups, how do, you, how do you look differently at climate tech? Do you look differently at climate tech startups? How do you assess their uh, financial strength, their financial position? And maybe you have some growth strategies financially for uh, climate tech ventures? Yes, so I think climate tech startups do have uh, certain categories that we do take a deep dive into once we analyze this uh, sector. The first thing is, uh, you know, the IP, the innovation. Do they have a unique innovation, the IP? The second thing is the market. Of course, the market is super important because it's a market that is full with regulation and, um, you know, and compliance. And the startups need to uh, navigate through that. The third thing is, of course, we're bankers. We look at financials. We look at the, the profitability. And sometimes, you know, the contracts take longer time. The startup needs to take, a, in, you know, incentive, grants, funding, take it all into consideration. But a, I, I might surprise you, even though we are a bank and we look at the financials, not only dreams, we really look at the co-founding team. And I can tell you a story that in 2019, before Climate Tech was a, a, a thing and everybody, you know, it was, in, there was investors, VCs. I was a judge in one of the panels of one of the programs for early stage startups, and there was a young entrepreneur that came into the room, gave an amazing pitch, and he, he sold a dream. Um, one of the panelists, he finished his pitch, told him, okay, listen, this is not gonna happen. Don't waste another minute on it. Go home, think about something else, because you're not getting into this program, no funding, and she really was someone that understood the climate tech ecosystem and you know uh, she had credentials to say that and and like thinking about the startups and that happened you know it happens to the startup every day but this unique entrepreneur went home he didn't give up he, he raised a substantial amount of funds and I met him a year later and he raised a hundred million and and now more wow. and more and the story is about his resilience and his ability to bring the co-founding, the best co-founding team into the table. And that's a secret, because all the categories that I said before, you know, the financials, the market, the innovation, nothing can happen without the right team bringing it together. So you can't, you can't have only the team without the others, right? We do need to look at something, but I think the magic happens when you look at all of it together. And at Polim Tech, we work with people first thing so wow so so you know we usually say uh, at Grove people first so yes. definitely people first it also helps if you have uh, some money later <laughs> but uh, people first that's why we like to work with you you know uh, you. and regarding a uh, growth strategy I might, I might say a few words about that I think at a startup from the climate tech should work with partners partners like Dorel and others that can give them benefits and have, subs and have substantial ability to assist those startups and, and have channels, channels to work with, such as other startups in other domains, but here it's, it can really help. The second thing is um, the operational efficiency. I think this is a major uh, important, uh, something that can, get, can have hyper growth on, on the startup because 
for startup in the climate tech, you have, of course, the technology, but uh, not like SaaS companies, you have also hardware. And you really need to have a good COO or CFO that works with you. And I can tell you the story I told you before about this entrepreneur that really succeed and, and, uh, and now he sells in scale. He took a CFO from a low tech company, really a big corporate, to have a, with him alongside the road from the very beginning, from like it was an A stage. This CFO has seen and worked with corporate, huge corporate, but he brought him because he knew how to manage the hardware side of it, the operational side, the financial side, and bring it all together. And I think one of his uh, success was this, that he, he really understood it from the, from the get-go. Um, the third thing that I think uh, all startups should uh, keep in mind, that go take advice from people that have walked the road. Like Lior, you, you, have, you, have, you have tackled a few problems along the way with uh, your prior ventures, and really to go to those partners that not just read like a report or two, that really understood, they have the, you know, they have scars on their skin, and, and take it into account and listen to them. Uh, also from companies that work on, uh, like Dora, that is uh, working on with energy companies and, and doing it every day, that's, that's super important. Uh, the third thing is incentive and Fund that are not dilutive. I think that for for this kind of climate tech startups from all stages, super important. And here I might I might mention the bank. Like, you know, credit facilitation for startups can have a really a, can impact the the success of the startup because banks know how to you know um, give credit facilitation to different kind of startup, especially climate, because there is a financial model behind it, there's a hardware, there's a f software, so I think that something can leverage the success of the startup uh, and have it, you know, succeed in scale. Wow, so definitely very different from, as you said, SaaS companies, but also for many other types of ventures. So Lee, I'm, I'm guessing that also legal-wise, there are some differences, uh, or maybe even significant differences, you tell us between uh, climate tech uh, startups and, um, and other startups. So what are the common legal challenges of, that are specific to climate uh, startups? And how do you give us a few tips for uh, climate tech startups other than, than working with a legal firm that knows this business? Uh, give us a few tips for uh, founders of uh, climate tech startups. Yeah, so. Um I think, I mean, nobody likes regulation, right? But I think that uh, regulation is a bottleneck that is more dominant in climate tech than in other sectors. And I think that one reason for this is the fact that many industries in this sector, such as energy or water, for example, are heavily regulated because they are related to national infrastructure. And so it requires a startup from its very early stage to be aware and in compliance with pretty complex regulation. So, for example, if I have a technology aiming to uh, filter drinking water, uh, at first I can test it in a bucket, right? That's not a problem. But if I want to test it on a larger scale and to conduct a pilot, then I'll need to go through this whole process of requiring all permits. And this is something that can be very time consuming and cause delays uh, to the business plan. And sometimes the problem is even bigger uh, in the event that a change in regulation is required because the current regulation does not even address the new technology. And for a small startup to, um, to uh, create a change in regulation is practically impossible. Um, and I think that this legal challenge is very, very frustrating because even if you did the impossible and you've managed to overcome all these challenges and you scale up and you want to operate in other countries, then you might need to go through this process again and again because you will be working under different uh, regulatory regimes. Uh, so I think this is a, a big challenge that startups in this sector are facing. And what we see is that many startups deal uh, with this challenge uh, and as I D said, um, by creating strategic partnerships uh, with leading companies um, in their sector, uh, which on the one hand have an interest in their technology, 
and on the other hand have the means to mitigate these legal challenges, whether it is by using their existing uh, facilities instead of constructing new ones, so it saves time and trouble uh, during the, regu the regulatory process, whether it is by using their expertise and experience so they can guide you to assure you are in compliance with the regulation and or shorten the time frame to reach such compliance, or whether it is in the event that a change in regulation is required, such leading companies may have more uh, access and influence on the regulator to reflect the need for a certain change. Uh, wow, thank you. So, uh, Matan, uh, I saved a special question for you. Um, when you look at uh, companies at the early stage, okay, uh, uh, um, what, um, what metrics or what uh, measures do you use to, to evaluate or assess these type of companies? But even more important, give us a few tips for what early stage climate tech companies need to do so they would seem lucrative for late stage investors. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, so by way of disclosure, I'm more of a late stage investor in this kind of setting. So generate invest really in the infrastructure, building out the project well after it's out of the lab. Um, we show up at events like this really to see what's coming down the pipe, where innovation's going, what might be interesting later. But that dialogue goes both ways. To your question, the earlier stage ventures need to know what it takes to get to scale. Um, scale is really where the impact happens on, on the climate. If we want to move the needle, we have to deploy solutions at scale, whether it's renewable energy or steel or cement or any of these industries, it's at scale. Um, and for that, it needs to be de-risked on the technology front. It needs to be repeatable and predictable. And we look and see, is this technology, is the solution on that path? Is every new project going to be different, different engineering, different design? Or are they going to kind of rapidly repeat um, and de-risk the solutions? Uh, we look to see if the team is looking at that scale. Um, if it's not the right team to get to that kind of scale, it's probably not going to be interesting for us. To your point on, on bringing perhaps a CFO earlier than you might need, um, bringing along the people that can get the company to scale, um, it's critical. We, when I started as an infrastructure investor, I focused really on the project. I, in prior lives, had done venture and, 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 and said that's maybe not for me. And I went to the assets and I thought that's easier. But it does go back to the people, you need the right people to develop the projects to build these companies to scale because no one wants to do a single asset. And so being able to do that is, um, is something I would um, have folks keep in mind for very early on. Um, and the last point I'd say to earlier stage companies is to make sure the solution your problem you're solving is really a problem people care about. Uh, meaning there's actually a customer that actually cares about that. There's lots of efficiency gains to be had. There's lots of more or effective ways to do things. We need it to be in, in a high priority for a customer uh, for it to gain traction. Uh, and early on to get that feedback from the market to make sure you're not holding a solution looking for a real problem. Thank you. So, uh, Roy, uh, you are a very, very important type of animal in our ecosystem, in our uh, jungle of uh, innovation, your uh, corporate venture um, um, investor. And I personally think that corporate venture uh, investors play a very, very unique and important role in, in uh, the life cycle of uh, climate tech startups. So maybe tell us a little bit uh, on what's your way of thinking, how it's a different probably from, from regular venture and Maybe give us an example of, uh, uh, example of, two of how this partnership between investors slash corporate can benefit both sides. Great. Um, so I'm the head of uh, Doral Energy Tech Ventures. So Doral, the mothership, is a global renewable energy developer. So first of all, um, one area that we bring value to the, to the startup companies is by presenting the market, basically. Uh, and explaining what, uh, what, what we care about uh, and, uh, and how a product development should look like down the line. And in some cases, corporate can also be a customer or an anchor customer or a potential offtake uh, for, uh, for a startup in the future. Now, on 
Let's go one by one. First of all, assumptions. Uh, most of the, um, uh, so the corporate VC world is divided between basically strategics and financials. The new wave of corporate VCs, like ourselves, are very much financially oriented. And basically, our decision-making processes is uh, similar to a uh, uh, venture traditional financial uh, VC. So it means that uh, some, some of the corporate VCs are structured like, like funds and uh, the compensation mechanism looks the same. And as a result, the decision-making processes throughout the, the, the way would look the same. There are others, uh, are some corporations that are mostly strategics, uh, and they are um, formed in a di quite a different way, which means they, they care about the strategic fit to their corporate first, and without any buy-in from the business unit and the strategic angle, they will not go ahead and, and continue with investments. So. Uh, one tip is to uh, understand the, the, the nature of the corporate VC that you are speaking with because, there, because it will influence or at least you, it will provide you some understanding of how they make decisions down the line. Now, um, when it comes to um, strategics, um, I think managing expectations is really, really important between other financial investors and the corporate VC and also with the startups in what value we, c we think we can bring and what we cannot bring into the, t into the table. Now, we prefer to invest more early on and I think that uh, you, s you will see more and more corporations prefer to do early on because they want to have this first visibility, first look into technologies to host in alpha site, beta site and so on and later on uh, to be able to be at the forefront and some edge on their project development capabilities or if you are uh, uh, an, an, uh, a corporate that sell products, for example, you want to see some disruptions in the market. Um, and the way that we are engaging with startups is basically plain vanilla uh, transactions uh, like any other uh, corporate, like any other VC. Uh, it, it do, uh, it, it's really, really important also to understand uh, and to and to see that you have a good leadership, not only from the corporate venture angle, but also from the mothership itself, from the business unit themselves. Because eventually the innovation department or the corporate VC can open the door for you, but the actual execution will not come from that department. It will come from their carton parts at the business unit. So for a startup that's, that says that you have like good connection with, I don't know, top tier energy company, whatever it might be, try to speak directly with the business unit in parallel to their uh, innovation departments. Because there, the decision-making processes is really important, and they will be the one that will eventually take you hand by hand throughout the regulation, throughout the integration, throughout procurement, and so on. Uh, and as a result, it's really, really important for you to distinguish with who from a, a large corporation do you actually speak with, and to make sure that they can deliver the value that you will need from them beyond just capital. Excellent. So you definitely mentioned one good strategy for a climate tech startup to, to, to secure partnerships. And that is a, and by that secure growth, go talk to the business unit. If you can also get some money from the, from the innovation arm, that's great. I'm going to open it up for everyone else. Everyone think of one additional strategy for a, for a, Climate tech standard, how can you boost your growth? Right, so there's the standard uh, go sell, go, go, bring, go bring partners, but taking into account that these type of uh, startups are usually more deep tech, more um, oriented on a more complex problem in terms of who, who is the buyer and, who is, um, and where does the money come from. Can you give me one, one additional uh, cool tip? So I've seen companies use um, old infrastructure that's been abandoned to run pilot sites for free. Um, their coal plants are being decommissioned, dry wells on geothermal. There's lots of infrastructure assets that aren't actually in use. It's, they're not easy to find. But uh, they can reduce the cost of some of those early pilots, which are expensive and, and hard to get funding for. Um, so getting a site for free get, gets you, it's like non-recurring engineering and, and, and other incentives. I would say that it's really, really important, especially for early stage startups, uh, that 
to go in parallel on the commercial side in addition in parallel to the technology uh, scale up and engineering scale up or scientific scale up that they need to show throughout the TRLs level that they are that are developing the, the one mistake that the many startups early stage startup is making is by saying or at least thinking that only the scale up on the science side or the engineering side will be sufficient enough to them to be the inflection point for the next funding round the uh, the bar for in, uh, for growth equity or later stage investment went high very dramatically. So it means that you need to de-risk your business, not only from the engineering work, but also from the commercial work. And here I, I do agree with you that as long as you will be able to secure some uh, off -take, future off-taking agreement, if you are a carbon uh, company, for example, or if you are a fuel, sustainable aviation, aviation fuel company, or if you want to do um, and so off-taking agreements, land permits, uh, actual customers that will be willing to work, you, uh, to work with you down the line. It's extremely important because then the investors later on will say, okay, we see that there is a signal from the market. The market will buy it. Now we need to take the risk of the first of its kind or, or for uh, the next uh, scale-up uh, phase that the startup needs to go. So please, <laughs> go in parallel commercial alongside scaling up in the lab. I will add on the ROI. It is also true from the investment side, no, no doubt about it, but also from credit facilitation. Want to see if you hit the milestone in your past, the past record, and you have to have, I think maybe, you know, the IP, the innovation is mandatory, right? It's a startup. That is what it's all about. But the business side, it's what gets you to the next level. What, and, and, for this intensive capital kind of companies, it's super important. You can't, you can't have, and, and if you're really looking for non dilutive funds, and you have to, because VC won't get you all the way. You have to use other channels of funding. This is mandatory. Go bring out sales, have track record, see that what you promise is what you really, uh, in the end, succeed to, to have. So. I think that working from the investment side and also from the uh, credit facilitation side, the business side, the market side is it the most important thing. I think that um, in a I think that what you said is super uh, uh, super critical because in many cases I talk to to founders and they say we are now raising five, six, seven, ten doesn't matter, and we'll think about next funding round later. In our type of uh, industries, in climate tech, you need to have a funding roadmap. It's not like, so okay, in, in, uh, in other types of uh, startups, yes. Seed A, B, C, it all comes from uh, venture and gets to a point where the, where, where, where the company is um, either goes for an exit of for an IPO in climate tech startups you need a funding roadmap I'm gonna take my seed from venture and I'm gonna take non-dilutive funding from this and that and then my A is gonna be CVC or government grants you need to have a plan and you need to build for that plan that is super critical there is another uh, methodology or tactics that we use uh, uh, which we call it the pre-order book so this is true that you cannot deliver some products at day one or at day two, but at least you can come up with some pre-order book, like really loose type of contracts, but it signals to the market and to the, to the next lead investor that there is something there. So for example, if you can grow an order book to the, to the degree of a few millions, dozens of millions, whatever the number is, but then the next investor can see, okay, now the money that I put in the company would be to execute on this contract that will be converted as a full contract. And then the perception of, or at least the first slide of a company you showed, you scale up, and here is an order book of $100 million that we are going to, to, to execute on that. And then the, the, the level of imagination that investors would need to do is shortened dramatically because they, they can understand and they have a trajectory of where the money goes and how do you make money out of it. Because green premium on that front will not take you that long. Or grants will also not take you that long. So, Lee? 
Yeah, so I just wanted to add from a legal perspective that it's not a growth strategy, but uh, in order to avoid obstacles towards this growth strategy, then um, keep uh, as much as possible uh, all uh, legal issues organized from the beginning, from day one. Uh, whether it is between the founders, whether it is IP, uh, all uh, agreements and contracts in those partnerships. So I think that this is something that is uh, to keep in, back in your mind. So I'm going to follow up on that. Yeah. And you just said the, the two formidable and very important letters, IP. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about IP and patents in the, in the climate world, right? So, so obviously very important. We just discussed that in, uh, in, in climate tech, a technology mode is probably more important than in many other uh, fields. Um, so tell us a little bit about IP for, uh, for, uh, for uh, climate. And also touch a little bit on the fact that usually when you start to take grants, government grants and other types of grants and other types of partnerships and collaborations that involve money, there's also a high risk of IP contamination and other types of IP loose ends. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think that for every startup, uh, IP is, is a uh, protection of IP is crucial, right? Not just in climate tech. But I think that the difference is that uh, whereas uh, um, pure software companies are uh, safeguarded, at least to some extent, by copyright laws, here we are talking about products that are usually um, mainly based on hardware, and so the protection by patent registration becomes very relevant. Um, otherwise, you face the risk that someone could copy your idea, or that uh, you will find out in the future that someone breaches, uh, that you breach someone else's IP uh, that he already protected by a patent. Um, and I think that if we are talking about the fact that partnership with very sophisticated uh, players uh, becomes uh, very relevant from a startup's early stage, then the um, timing of the patent registration becomes a strategic decision and not just uh, a technical one. So definitely I would recommend, I mean, there, there is no clear guideline or tip to uh, how to do that, but I would suggest definitely to consult, um, uh, consult before uh, getting uh, starting uh, the road uh, to see what is the time, uh, the correct time to do so. Thank you. So, um, Matan, we, Adi mentioned uh, grants and government grants, uh, Roy mentioned grants, I mentioned grants, and, and, and but other than grants, uh, um, these partnerships with governments or large organizations or large. Um, associations are clearly a, a growth hack for any type of uh, uh, climate tech ventures. Again, very different from many other types of startups. And you have all this background on, uh, on, uh, on funding, both on the early stage and on the later stage and even on the project side. So maybe, maybe talk a little bit about uh, obtaining that and the uh, pitfalls in, uh, in uh, obtaining these types of, uh, of uh, funding for, for startups? Yeah, so I'd say when I started, I had more of an, an engineering approach um, and had wanted very little to do with regulation and legislation. And, and as long as the regulators set the boundaries, let them stay uninvolved and let the rest of us do our work and get things done. Uh, I've, I've matured beyond that, and I realize that the regulators in many cases actually want to help. They just don't know how. And it is incumbent on other industry participants to tell them, hey, this is what the market needs to look like if you want to have the effects you're looking for, um, whether it's employment targets that they have, um, environmental targets that they have, health and safety targets. In actually sitting down with them, the legislation is not as fixed as it might seem. It evolves all the time, and it can evolve in particular in, in the parts of the market where we are most active. Renewable natural gas, which became a much bigger thing in the past five or 10 years, didn't have all the legislation necessary. Um, the ability to do distributed energy and storage and interconnect with the grid and charge and discharge in different ways, having visibility, all that legislation, knowledge availability, access to information is things that we uh, as the startups, as the ecosystem can tell the leg regis legislator what it is that we need, and we should not um, shy away from it. In many cases, you can actually shape it to, to be the way you want it to be. 
as a startup, if you make that investment and stay closer to the legislation, you'll also likely know earlier how it's going to play out and lets you position to benefit from it. It's not only about the grants. Sometimes what the market needs is just certainty. Just tell me that this law will be grandfathered for 20 years. If you hold it constant, the ecosystem will work. And, and it's not just the grants that unlocks financing. Sometimes the certainty or clarity around what is organic and how do you define it. And certainty from the industry unlocks other parts of the capital. So I would encourage you all to, to engage with the legislators and the regulators. They are, there's not much in attendance in this room, which is telling, other than the Innovation Authority. Um, but there is room for that to be part of the conversation. So you touched on a super, super uh, point, and I want maybe some of you to try and elaborate um, on that. From my painful experience, uh, it's hard for an early stage startup to engage with regulators because you're an early stage startup. But on the other hand, having y your eyes on the regulation and the coming changes is super important because regulation change can be the make or break of your venture. Because the regulation changes, the market collapses, the market surges in a different country, and you need to be very, very sharp on that. So maybe talk a little bit about uh, uh, how can early stage startups not just engage with regulators, but also react to changes in uh, regu regulation which can affect grants, but can also affect the entire existence of the market. And any of you that have an interesting story to share, my story is too painful to share. So I, I just can add one thing on, on our side. So within my team, we, uh, we have a value creation uh, manager. and. She's a regulator re, la, uh, girl, lady, woman. Uh, she came from the California Public Utility Commission. She was basically the regulator of state of California for energy electrification and so on, and, and renewable energy. So the value creation as a fund that, that invests in that space is basically that, navigating through regulation. Uh, and it serves us in many ways. First of all, to any startups that need support in regulation. Second of all is to identify trends where the regulation is adding, for example, for sustainable aviation fuels or for textile recycling in Europe or whatever it might be, because then this is the new technologies that we will need to demonstrate further down the line when the regulation will come and play a role. Um, and it's also important, I think that Martin was mentioning, there are, s or I can't remember who, but there are so many sub-regulations because sometimes you can work extremely well in California but it will not work for you in the Midwest, for example. So it's really important to say and to understand and to navigate through regulations. Um, I think, and if I can connect the dots, it's basically saying um, that an energy or climate tech startups need to, th to think about the end, how a project at the end would look like, what they need to show, what type of permits do they need, and then to th start thinking about the product, about integration, architecture, funding, and so on. And I think that this exercise is extremely important. I can add to that that something is happening, right? Regulation changes startups. We see that AI, ChatGPT killed some startups. The other ones are saying we have, team of, we have a team that's al always looking out for the next and how we can integrate AI. And I think my, some, you can take the similarities into climate tech. And in climate tech, I know for us, let's say at Bank Poalim, we have Sharon Alouf, which is leading the ESG. She was there from the get-go where this ecosystem started. And I think like working with bank, with other corporate that really invest all their time to understanding the development, uh, you can get good and great knowledge and insight from working with them and understanding because they're looking at the trend, they're looking to see what they will need and how will they gonna react to those regulations and you can adopt and have a pivot through understanding the corporate and what they need and because they are very close to regulation. So before, when we started this event today, they, they talked about climate tech and they're looking for right investment, knowledge, think knowledge from, from us. I'm, well, whoever wants, we are open, just reach out freely to me and Sharon and we can uh, assist from our side. But I think other corporates can really give benefits on, we have special people that, that their jobs. Yeah. 
So you talked about look at the end and walk your way back. Amazing tip. Let's talk about the beginning because a lot of the people that are listening to us are early stage startups. So, you know, when, when I meet early stage startups, when you meet early stage startups, when, when we all look at early stage technologies, even you, if you have to decide which startup to work with, uh, we're taking a bet, right? It's pre-revenue. It's, in many cases, pre-proof of concept even. So let's talk a little bit on how do we de-risk that, right? So you make an investment in, a, in an early stage startup, or you make a time investment, or a banking a credit for, for, for an early stage startup. How do you de-risk? So one thing, I'm not going to let you say people again, because we all agree. We start with the people. People are the most important thing. <laughs> but other than that, I just killed your answer, right? But, but I, have other a, I have another one. Uh, good. <laughs> But other than that, uh, how do you de-risk the investment and the time spent on early, early stage startups? Everyone say a few words because our time is almost up. Okay, I can uh, for... Almost up. Okay, so I'll, I'll summarize with this. At Poalim Tech, we understood this problem from early stage startup when financing and we have a new product that is bridging the... IIA uh, grants, and I think that working for us, working with IIA or other uh, parties that give grants and assisting them, like have few people come together in order to hold, help those startups. So we do that, first of all, working, having these products that are specialized for early stage startup, bridge loans that are very generous, but we work with several a good corporate such as I to support the startups and from the other hand other other you know um, platform that we use we 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 have a mentorship program we take founders that already walk the road and uh, bring them alongside to help this early stage startup help them to navigate this uh, special and challenging times um, different you know, um, specialized meetings such as road shows that the investors can maybe spend a little bit more time with, a, with an entrepreneur to get to know him, to understand his model, and in the end to invest. So we do other value creation to de-risk. Yeah, uh, if you are an IP company, I think you can run like freedom to operate uh, search, which is really important because it's the core of your product and the core of the asset actually. It's cost a lot of money, so maybe, I don't know if you have good mechanism for startups, but freedom to operate is one key if you have an IP uh, company. And second of all, to make sure that you fundraise uh, that will take you uh, to uh, the next inflection point in a, in, a, in a fundable milestone. And think about it really thoroughly, because it's not just taking the money and it, everything will be fine. As we said, funding plan. Yes. It's super important, again, commercially and, uh, and tec technically, that will allow you to fundraise the next 20, 25, 30 million dollars that you need to. And not EBSEDER, like cyber, we will do the markup, no. Think about it. <laughs> so Adili, Matan, Roy, thank you very, very much. Our time is up, thank you very much. <laughs>